Well, praise the Lord. Amen. Let you all stand look to the Lord this morning. Uh, <clears throat> Sister Nora called and uh, had prayer for John. Uh, apparently, he did fall, and uh, he might have a cracked rib, so it's going to be a little difficult for you to to and especially with her arm being not in the best of shape as well. And uh, Saturday, uh, Friday, what's Friday with May, was it? Yeah, fr or early Saturday morning, uh, May's mother took a stroke, so she's in the hospital now and uh, seems to be doing okay, so, uh, so there's needs to be met, so praise the Lord. And I thank God for healing my mother, so she's back home. There may be other needs here this morning as we're looking to the Lord. Unspoken, Unspoken? yes, okay. All right, let's all lift up our voice together. Heavenly Father, as we come before thy throne of grace, Lord, we're thankful, Lord, that we can approach thee through the blood of Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we are here, Lord, as a people, Lord, to come to worship thee and to praise thee, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that you would have your way in this service, and Lord, we'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory. Remember those that are not here, those that are sick and afflicted, Lord, wherever they may be on thy footstool, Lord, and thy nation Israel. We ask this now in that precious name that's above every name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated this morning. I'm going to ask Brother Paul Obey to lead us. I think it's Brother Paul this morning, so praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's good to see everyone out this morning. We're so thankful to be here this morning. Move on me, Holy Spirit.
just read His Word and pray till you pray through. Don't be dismayed when try. This morning, four, four, four in the blue. You want to start it, Brenda? Search for all eternity, Lord, and find there is none like you. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I 
Anybody else have a number this morning?
Come on over to the winning side. We're following Jesus. We got a banner so high. We're God's mighty army. We won't be denied. Oh, come on over to the winning side. If you're tired of losing, in life's war searching for something worth fighting for going in the army has proven and tried so come on over to the winning side come on over to the winning side we're following Jesus, we got a banner so high. For God's mighty army, we won't be denied. Come on over to the winning side. We march through the fire, but we just wouldn't burn. We march through the water. Just wouldn't learn. We march through the lines then. Oh, Daniel, he cried. Those lions can hurt me. I'm on the winning side. So come on over to the winning side. We're following Jesus. We got our banners so high. God's mighty army, we won't be denied. Come on over to the winning side. We march through the fire, but we just wouldn't burn. We've marched through the water, but we just wouldn't learn. We march through the lines then. Daniel, he cried, these lions can hurt me, I'm on the winning side, oh come on over to the winning side, we're following Jesus, we got our banner so high, we're God's mighty army, we won't be denied. Come on over to the winning side. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And we are on the winning side. Praise the Lord. I just want to thank the Lord. Uh, we were driving to Ontario this week, uh, this past week. And it was a long drive and a lot of traffic and... Uh, I'm thankful for his traveling mercies there and back and a few close calls. There's always close calls when you, and uh, I'm just thankful he had his hand on us and he watched over us and brought us, brought us there safely and back. And uh, I just want to thank him this morning. Ninety-four in the red.
195 195 <laughs>
Thank you, Lord. Brother York, you have a song? Can I sing? No. <laughs> Anything? I'm a pilgrim on a journey headed for a better land. The way it's rough and trials so hard to understand. I call the one who started with me, said he'd be there till. He blesses me again And it's so hard to comprehend He takes thought of me The stars, they shine The sun rises all Just a small, small grain of sand In the wonders of His hands And now He blesses me He blesses me again I've not always been the best man For the Lord that I Yes, and sometimes I've given in. Oh, but the Lord, He's great in mercy. In the moment I repent, I find He blesses me. He blesses me again. Two nineteen in the red book. I'm gonna play it in V, Brenda. Jesus. 
Jesus, keep me near the cross. There's a precious fountain free to all a healing stream.
Savannah, do you feel like singing a song this morning? Or? No? Okay. Just checking. <laughs> Eli, do you have a song this morning? Thank you, Lord. In the harvest fields now ripen, there's a work for all to do. On earth the master's voice is calling to the harvest calling you. And does the place that you're called to labor seem so small and little known? Oh, is it great if our God is in it? For he will not forsake his own. Oh, with all his much, when God is in it. Oh, waver not for altar frame. Oh, there's a crown and you can win it. If you go in Jesus' name. And when the comfort year has ended And our race on earth is won He will say, if you've been faithful Welcome home, my child well done Oh, will you as much when God is in it Oh, waver not for wealth or fame Oh, there's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. And when the comfort year is ended and our race on earth is won, oh, he will say, if you've been faithful, welcome home, my child well done. Oh, will you always watch when God is in?
Did you have a song this morning? I'm reaching out. To you, dear Lord, I'm reaching out to you. I know your arm is not too short, that it can reach me too. And as I pray and I wait into your kingdom,
Everybody happy? All right. With that, we'll turn the service over to Brother Fred. If we could all stand. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. That horse has followed me all week, so <clears throat> I'm trying to park it somewhere. But praise the Lord. 
Heavenly Father, as we come to this part of the service, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you would use this vessel and play as you would see fit, Lord, as we would look into your word. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us in this hour. Now, commit this part of the service in your hands. In that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated this morning. <clears throat> Just as a place to start, let's go to Revelation chapter 8 this morning. <clears throat> and in Revelation, the eighth chapter, really it's the place uh, continuing on from last Sunday, how that we've seen that Jesus was pictured among the candlestick. But it's not, he is not pictured like at the beginning or in the middle of the church ages, but he's shown when it is completed. Because he's there dressed with hair white as wool, and his eyes is a flame of fire, and that's none other but you want to him showing him in his judge office. And that judge office is, I realize that when, we, especially when we read in this hour, that really has come to light is second, second Timothy four, verse one, part A of it. Because there's two part to that, that verse. Where he's going to come and judge the the quick and the dead. And I know if you've heard it many times, but sometimes we need to hear things again. So I'm just bringing us back from last Sunday to where we're going to continue on this week. And as he is the judge of the dead, that's those bright saints, once that seventh seal is broke, that's when his judgeship begins. Because it shows him in that Revelation chapter 1, the church ages is complete. So is the grace age in its completion role, if you want to. As far as no one coming in to be a bride or foolish virgin and so forth. But the judging of the quick. Never has there been a time. <clears throat> that in the hour that we live in, in these last 100 years, has that really been touched about judging the quick? That's the living element that will come in through that seventh seal factor or the half hour time factor. Now when I say the half hour, I just don't mean the half hour of the silence when, he, when everybody is a shock when he opens the seventh seal. Because there's a whole lot of things taking place. And the only place that you can put Jesus as the judge is in this time period here. He can't be there in the wedding supper. Praise the Lord, because he's going to feast with the bride, you and I, and I'm thankful for the Lord for that. But as we would look at in chapter 8, there's some verses in this chapter that will show there are types and shadows, or types you want to, that is in Ezekiel's vision that will go along with what we're looking at here, going to be looking at here this morning. So as we're nearing the time, yes, <clears throat> in, verse, in chapter 8, verse 1, when he had opened the seventh seal, there was a silence in heaven for about the space of half hour. That's just the silence because the shock of him opening it, because it's been, they've been for over 2,000 years. He's been sitting on the throne, but really... If we're looking at the type, he's been sitting on the throne till 1963. Because he did pick up the scroll then. And 63, he opened six of them. And so I imagine from 63, they're all in heaven, all in anticipation. When is he going to open that seventh one? And when he does, yes, everything's hushed for a moment. But then for just a short space of time, then in heaven, they're all saying with a loud voice, he's worthy to receive power, honor, and glory, and so forth, and so forth. So that's the start of that time factor. 
but the time factor will only go so long while that seventh seal, as it's been broke, yes, the angel of Revelation chapter 10, he comes and he cries with a loud voice. And if the seven thunders are just going to utter their voices, if his voice is loud, that means something's going to shake. And what's going to shake? He'll be introducing his judgeship. And he's universal, one foot on land, one foot on the sea. Yes, that angel comes with the clothes of the cloud of God Almighty. He's dressed and invested with, as shown as having the characteristic of Jesus Christ, so he's going to be speaking on behalf of Christ. But it's an angelic being that's doing it, under the direction of God and Jesus Christ. Because if we look at the order of headship. So now as those thunders that are taking place, that's not the only thing that takes place in that time factor. That's where the quick are going to be judged. And I know there's a lot of people looking at it, but I'm not going to hold back and stay back there hoping everybody catches up. I was looking at the prophet Jeremiah in his day, in the day that Ezekiel had the vision. He was a, he was a prophet, a major prophet, and yet, nobody believed his message. He was so discouraged. It talks about in one place he was about ready to quit. Now, oh, here's a major prophet. God gives him a message, nobody believes it. It's almost like Brother Branham. While the healings were going, that's great. But while he preached the word, the denomination didn't want to hear a thing. It repeats itself in the life and the ministry of Brother Jackson the same way. Those that should have came in didn't believe his message. It's a repeat after repeat after repeat. But anyway, I'm getting away from what I'm looking at here. Now it says here, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar. Now this is the part we're going to be looking at when we're looking into Ezekiel's vision as we're going on. He stood by the, at the altar having a golden censer. Now there's a golden bowl or, or cup, well, not really a cup, but it's like a bowl. And there was given to him much incense. Now, this is an angelic being. He's here. Time-wise, if all we knew that he came before the altar and he had a golden bowl of incense, there's no place where you could really identify it, scripturally speaking. But when it says he offered it with all, with the prayers of all the saints, that means, read between the line, that's all the saints that God's going to be dealing with concerning his bride and salvation of those that prayed, that prayed up to that hour. All right? And... Now, when it says all the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar. So he's, there's an altar, not this is a physical altar in heaven, but he's there before the golden altar, which is a type like where the Old, the Old Testament priest was before the altar, before the presence of God. Why is this angel doing it and not Jesus Christ himself? Because there's a purpose. We'll see that he's a type of Melchizedek. And I can see that angel... Uh, or in future of the past. Melchizedek would be fulfilling this role of this angel that's offering all the prayers, because remember, he's in a function of a high priest. And all the prayers, you have to pull in Revelation chapter 4 or 5, where it talks about where the 24 elders had bowls of all the prayers, and not only them had the bowls of prayers, and they were just holding it. Nowhere does it say they were offered in chapter 4 or 5 of Revelation. And also the beasts were holding the prayers. And those beasts, according to Ezekiel, is the living creatures, the same thing, and they are cherubims, it's the same thing. It's just a description of the time how God wants to portray these four. 
And they, these were holding prayers also. So it shows from the days of Adam, the days of the uh, 12 patriarchs of the old, 12 patriarchs of the new, and us praying even during this time period here, this angel is going to be offering all the prayers of mankind up to that hour in time because God is about ready to change things because he's going to be going into a new covenant after the wedding supper of ruling and reigning in the millennium. Which Jesus, we're going to reign and reign with Jesus Christ. Now as he's at that altar and he offered it with the prayers upon the, with all the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar. Now remember, this is all portrayed in glory, not on earth which was before the throne, and the smoke of the incense came with the prayers of the saints ascended before God out of the angel's hand. Now verse 5, we're going to see something in Ezekiel that types the very same thing that's going to be happening here. Although in Ezekiel he types his day, but it also points to this hour when this is transpiring here at the end. It won't be for us Gentiles, it'll be for the Jews. Because there was this, the vision of Ezekiel is mainly to the Jews because it was to be the house, for the house of Israel. All right, so now when he says here, And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it to the earth. And there were voices, thunderings, lightning, and an earthquake. When that takes place in glory, that gives the go-ahead signal for the seven angels which had the seven trumpet, they prepare themselves to sound. So you are looking at the time frame right here at the closing of that time factor. Now, what are these in verse 5? What is that fire that he filled the censer with? What is it? Can we know? Is it? Did the? Do we picture in our mind? He's a natural angel. He goes on between the altar and he grabs some coals of fire, something burning physically. Remember, it's typing something. And the best thing that I can look at it for typing that, if you want to mark it down, you don't have to turn your Bible to read it. But in Psalms 18 and 13 gives a good illustration of it. The Lord also thunders in heaven. And the highest his, gave his voice. And there was hail, stones, and coals of fire. The coals of fire is the burning word of God. Where? From all the altar. Now remember, off of the mercy seat between God dwells between two cherubims. And that's where the presence of God is. And when he would speak, especially something concerning something dynamic and the events that's going to transpire, that's why he types his voice like coals of fire, lightning and so forth. Something quick, something powerful. And he's going to be taken, and here in Revelation chapter 8, the angel, he takes it, and he casts it towards the earth. Now, is it going to be everywhere on the earth? No, it's going to affect the Jews that are here first, in that first half of the week of Daniel. Because those first four trump three trumpets are for the land of Israel. But the last three trumpets is for all mankind. Because now we're talking at the end. Now we're going to go, and since I've just laid a little background, we're going to see some types that I don't think I haven't seen to this point thus far, but it makes a whole lot of sense as we're going to be looking into the vision of Ezekiel this morning. To begin with, Ezekiel, there's three prophets that are in the same time, heir of time. One is, going to, is Ezekiel, which is the vision we're going to be looking at in chapter 1 and in chapter 10. Also some things in chapter 9. But as Ezekiel 
sees this vision at the, in the same period of time, not in the same year, they're all born in the same year. But Jeremiah was there on the on ground, Ezekiel was on ground, and Daniel was on ground. So there's three prophets on ground that God's going to use. And Ezekiel, he's a prophet out of the land. He's going to be seeing the glory of God leaving the temple. Yet he was not in the land. He was in captivity already. And most of his prophecies concerning the land and things are going to take, that's been taking place there that, and is yet to take place. And yet he never been in the land to see it. He prophesied outside of the land. He, he, was, he lived in, in Babylon and he remained his, the rest of his life in Babylon as far as in, in, in that empire as far as history records him. All right. So to give you acquaintance of time, that was in the time of the dispersion after God was very distraught about what Israel was doing at that hour in, um, well, 600 B.C. It's about 600 B.C. Before, before Christ ever came. It's in about that period of time. While I'm looking at that and while the, with the evil that was in the land, we talk about the evil, how that they didn't let the land rest and God was going to punish, punish them for 70 years. That was one punishment. But God was also very upset of the Jews in that hour, in their temple, not in their homes, but in the temple, they had statues of all, of all kinds of different gods in it. That's why God was displeased. That's why he wanted to lift his spirit from that temple, and it was going to be destroyed. God's God was, didn't, didn't, God will not have idols around him. And how that, what happened to the Jewish nations that had idols in their temple, or where God is represented to them, it also types the Catholic Church with all her idols in her places as well. And if there's a Catholic listening, to, well, they're, they weren't idols, they're, they're, they're saints. No, they're not. They were statues of pagan gods and idols, which they gave them new names, and it's in there in the Vatican. It's the same thing what the Jews had done, and God punished them for it, and that's why the Catholic Church is going to be punished in the road up ahead. But she's too blind to see. Doesn't have sight to see that. All right. Now... Again, I know it's in here somewhere. Oh, there it is. So Jeremiah, he was in the land. The bulk of his message was God's coming to, to correct the Jews and they're, they're going to be a punishment. You better flee. And they weren't believing his message. They thought they could stand up and God would be with them and fighting with them. But those that believe his message were saved or lived. Those that fought against the army that were coming, they died. And it was only a small minority that believed his message. Isn't that what we see today? With Brother Brown's message, Brother Jackson's message, and even if you want to, looking at the fivefold ministry. So while, now just a little bit of history, there were three dispersions that God would take the people out of the land. There was a first deportation in around 600 or 590, I forget the years, it's it's around 600 B.C. But it's in the second deportation that Ezekiel was brought to Babylon. And in the third deportation, that's when Daniel came into being the land. And Ezekiel had his visions 
six years later, seeing the destruction of the temple and the glory of God leaving from it. The distance between them is about 520 miles. And where he sees the vision, now whether, whether it's that the exact spot, I mean, don't go looking at a map geographically, but it's in Babylon, in the area of the Babylonian Empire, by the river Shebar, where Ezekiel seen this vision. Now as he sees this vision, and now we're going to turn to Ezekiel chapter 1. As long as my voice holds out, you're going to be okay. So. <clears throat> Starting at verse 4 is the beginning. I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. Now, why is it out of the north? There is a scripture that talks about that the mountain of God is in on the north side. Yeah, in Psalms 48 and 2, it says, Beautiful for situation and for joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the side of the north, the great city, the city of the great God. All right, so it's not just pulling strings out of the air. So God is not north up to where Russia is, but just north side of it, okay? Because Jerusalem is the place. North is... In, in all humanity is looking at things, usually it's, it's the higher end. It's up. South is down. You either have a compass, you ought to know that. All right. So he says, And the whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, a fire enfolding unto itself. It was like the pillar of fire that was seen in the days of Moses. But it was not a pillar. This was coming out of the sky, open, and this was just whirling. He was seeing this out coming out of the sky as, as he sees it coming towards him now. And the brightness of it was, as it was in the midst of the color of amber and the midst of a fire. So it was fiery to him. It was seen like burning hot, if you want to, as it's coming towards him. Now, that is just expressed... The colors is just sometimes to express the, how can I put it, the things that, that God's not, God's invisible. He, he don't have no color. But fire is something that's showing that something is burning. So he's coming, he's burning. He's not coming for joy. And out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. Now here, these living creatures are your same living creature that's in the book of Revelation. That's around, ab, ab, around the throne. Now there's something else there too. Well, since we're looking at the living creature and we're going to be looking at this. We look at this picture. The four living creature. We see them before the throne. The picture's not accurate. What do you mean? Is there not four living creatures? They're cherubims. Later on we'll see that Ezekiel calls them cherubims. So whether you call them living creatures, whether you call them beasts, or whether you call them cherubims, they are the same four because they have the four faces. Face of a man, face of an eagle, face of a, a bull, and a face of, a, of a, a lion. All four had the same faces. The reason that they're four faces is because they can look in every direction. And... As we are seeing here, these living creatures and their appearance was like the appearance of the likeness of a man. Now, it was not just something uh, odd shaped that it was not an alien, but it had somewhat of a form of a man, but these have wings. All right? And everyone had four faces and everyone had four wings. And there were feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf foot that sparkled, uh, yeah, sparkled like the color of, burnish, of burn, burnished brass, burnished brass. 
And they had in the hands, sorry, and they had the hands of a man under the wings, and on their four sides, their four, they four had their faces and their wings. So in other words, they had four wings, four faces. But here's one key that sort of opens this up. Their wings were joined to one another. Oh, yeah, well, they, yeah like, like, see, they can touch each other. That is not correct. If I had four person here and we're touching hands on each end, there's no way that it, it can be each one can touch. The two middle ones will touch, have both their hands touching, right? But the two in the end, nobody's touching that hand is out on the last one on the end, right? Or the other one on the other end. But it says they were all touching. So what formation were they in? They were in a formation of a square. Around, when it says in the book of Revelation chapter 4, when these beasts, says if they were around the throne, not just in front of the throne. What does this represent? It represents a type up to a point. Now remember, this vision that Ezekiel is seeing, it's prophecy in motion. And the fact that they can touch their wings and they're around the throne pictures you and I a part of what you and I would see Now, they weren't cubed, but they were forced, the building's four square, so it's square up the top. So it is a type of showing towards the new Jerusalem. It's perfect. These cherubs were perfect protecting the throne. And as they are protecting the throne, now here, I, I can't, there's only some things you can do with a picture or drawing. I couldn't make them round that you can see. Otherwise, you have to look at it in three dimension and tilt it to see, to look towards it. But if you can picture this, they are, had their wings touching to one another. That brings you back to Genesis when God sent those cherubims. Now, the word cherubim, that's, you can't say there's one, two, or three, or four. Because the cherubim, it, it's, it's just the way it's described. And so there was a cherubim with a flaming sword to keep the way from the access to the way of God. That's why I believe it's the same cherubims that you see in Ezekiel that it is before the throne in the book of Revelation. They are in the Garden of Eden. What are they protecting? The skies? No. The way and access to God. And when we look at it here, in the book of Revelation, those four beasts, the four living creatures, or the, if you want to, the, the four cherubims, they're around the throne protecting sinful mankind to access the throne to Jesus Christ or to God to begin with. And the only way we can have access to that throne is through the blood of Jesus Christ, which is the only permission that God has allowed mankind to reach the throne. That makes sense. So therefore, yes. Now I drew and tried to make another picture here, but all right. So we're going to go on here in in, uh, in Ezekiel chapter one. And their wings were joined to one another, and they turned not when they went. And they went everyone straightway forward. As for the likeness of their face, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion, and the face on the right side, and they four had the faces of an ox on the left side, and they all four had the faces of an eagle. Thus were their faces, and their wings were stretched upwards to, uh, sorry, 
and their wings were stretched upwards. Two wings of every one joined one to another again, see? And two covered their bodies. And when they went, and straight forward whither the Spirit would go, they went. And they turned not when they went. Now here. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. Now, I didn't say they were. It was like burning coals of fire. And the burning coals of fire, it was like, if you want to, like we've seen in Psalms, I believe it was yeah, 18, they hold the word of God. And like the appearance of lamps, and it went down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of the flash of lightning. They were just moving that quick. Now when he sees the vision, and we're going to drop down to verse 26 now, because I don't want to read the, oh, maybe uh, I'll read verse 16. Here's another part too. And the appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto color of beryl, for they had one likeness, and their appearance was, and their works were as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Now, a wheel in the middle of the wheel. If I have a round wheel, and I don't know, being a Gentile, I think, well, here's a wheel, one in the middle of a wheel, that's, uh, that's one inside it. No. It is inside, but that doesn't illustrate anything. But if one wheel is in the other, as the cherubim can go in any direction, as they see in any, in any directions, the wheel is just there to portray the, symbolically their motion. And a wheel being one wheel this way and the other wheel that way, and one inside the other, show they, the wheels, their motion could be in any direction. All directions. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord would want them to move. Does that make more sense than just one within the wheel, one spinning inside the other one? All right. So in verse 26 it says, And above the filament was, above that was, oh, sorry, and above the firmament that was over their head was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of sapphire. That's what you see in the book of Revelation. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the of a man upon it. Now, this is to portray the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not the Lord Jesus Christ. It's showing that God in time was going to have one that was going to sit on that throne. Because in all Ezekiel's visions, nowhere do you see Jesus Christ. Nowhere do you see the, four el the 24 elders either. But the four beasts or the four cherubims, they're seen from the Garden of Eden in Ezekiel and in the book of Revelation. So they, they, angels always, they've been created before man, so they don't die. Praise the Lord. Would it be, be nice to be an angel that way, not to die, not to be sick and so forth. But on the other hand, if you, make, if you get out with God in sin, there's no recourse for them. All right. So now, and the appearance of the bow was in the cloud, and in the rain was the appearance of the brightness round about. And there was the appearance of a likeness of the glory of God. When I saw it, I fell to my face, and I heard the voice that spake. Now I want to turn to Ezekiel, if you want to go to chapter 9, and I'll start at verse 11, uh, sorry. Verse 3 and 4, and then I'll go down to verse 11. And in the ninth chapter, now, <clears throat> as Ezekiel sees his vision that we've seen in chapter 1, 
he pauses there for a bit. Not that he pauses, but he gives the description of what, how things will be transpiring in Israel in the following chapters. Then he picks up the vision again in chapter 10. But before we get to chapter 10, we're going to look at a few things that are going to be typing exactly the same thing that's going to happen to Israel when the week of Daniel begins. It says here, And the glory of God of Israel was gone up from the cherubims, and when he was at the threshold of the house, and he called unto the man, he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the rider's horn in his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go throughout the midst of the city and in the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark upon the forehead of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abomination that be done in the midst thereof. And the abomination was great. There was infighting. There was, the temple was polluted with idols. It, it, as far as God was looking at it, it was terrible. And the majority of the nation didn't care. Except the few that hated the things, the way things were going. Just like the Christian today, the way society gone today, it's, we, we despise it. Yes. Not that we hate the people, but we hate the sinful things that are going on. All right? So now, as we drop down to verse 11... Now this man, it says here that man in linen, and verse 11, And behold, a man clothed with linen, which had the ink horn by his side, reported the matter, and says, I have done what thou hast commanded. In other words, he has sealed, he had marked everyone that sigh for the error that was taking place in their day. He didn't go with a spot of ink and then, hey, you, oh, okay, you're one and, I'll, and you're another one, and I'll mark you over there. No, remember, it's an, it's an adjunct being. He's marking, he's looking at those that hated the abomination, that and he marked those that believed Jeremiah's message. That was the mark he was looking for that was in their forehead which is a type also of what we're going to see in the, when the week of Daniel begins. We're, typing that, we're going to be typing that over. And so therefore, as what's going to happen, what has happened there that hour, as he is marking the people that was crying out for the, the abomination and, and the errors that were taking place in their day, they were marked by the message of Jeremiah, of a prophet. Now, transpose yourself to almost 2,800 years or so till we arrive through the week of Daniel. Now, sometimes in the Bible it talks about and the man. And we think about him as being a man. But angels sometimes is, ref is referred to as man. Because about, it talks, I'm going to, without turning a whole lot of scriptures here this morning, it talks about, about the man Gabriel, but he was an archangel. But the Bible sometimes talks about him, and the man, and a certain man, it's talking about him. It didn't say, well, the archangel came, and the archangel said this, but it refers to sometimes when he's speaking about an angel, when it's a relationship to dealing with man, it reads him as being a man. But now we arrive in the book of Revelation. You're in Revelation chapter 7 now. And in Revelation chapter 7, you have that angel that's flying out of the east. Now there's the gospel is now arriving to the Jews. And he has the seal of the living God. And he's going to seal all those with the mark. If you want to, he's going to seal all those 144,000 and the woman with that mark. Well, let me read it right because you'll have to excuse me because with this uh, flu there, your head swims a bit. So, Okay, chapter 7, verse 1. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding the winds of the earth. 
that the wind should not blow on the earth or on the sea or any trees. Now he sees in verse 2, And I saw an angel ascending out of the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Revelation chapter 7, verse 3 now, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. Now, was this angel going around? Whoop. Oh, I sealed this one. Whoop, I sealed that one. No, it's the, he's watching. It's just terminology showing those that would have this be born again, have this, well, not born again, but have the eternal life, having the seal of God, believing the message of the prophet, because without the message of the prophet, they could not have God in their life or being sealed with the promise of God because the Orthodox Jews reject it. And just like in the days of, his, of Jeremiah, the majority didn't want it. And the majority in the beginning of the week of Daniel does not want the message of those two prophets. Now, 144,000 and the, and the woman that could be maybe two, 2 million out of maybe 10 or 12 million at that hour is a minority. The rest don't want nothing to do with the two prophets. They're just too happy to sign the covenant with that Antichrist, which is the Pope at that hour. But yet God's going to send fire and brimstone. As we see now, that brings into place Revelation chapter 8, where it talks about that they took coals from off the altar and they sent it to the earth. In Ezekiel, he says it's sent to that city. Well, it is to the city because it was just to the nation of Israel in that hour. And the reason it's sent into the earth in Revelation chapter 8, verse 5, is because it's going to affect first, yes, the city and the land, but, then, but after the middle of the week, it's going to affect the earth. So now, we can see that type of what happened in the days of Ezekiel, of the one with the ink, or the ink horn and marking those there that hour, that is just symbolic to show you what's transpiring on ground. Just like this angel, he's not coming and going, whoop, I'm going to seal that one, I'm going to seal this one. It's the message that seals you. All right. I think we've, we've understood that part enough anyway. Now in Revelation, now, to further this on a little bit, because now we're going to look at some things in chapter 10. God's going to marry what's in Revelation chapter 8, verse 5. As we pick it up in the 10th chapter, I'll start at verse 1. Then I look, and behold, the firmament was above the head of the cherubim. So he's above the, above the cherubim's where appeared over them a sapphire stone and the appearance of lightness of a throne. So the just above the cherubims, around the cherubim, is that throne where God Almighty is himself. And he spake not to himself. Now he's speaking to somebody. Catch it? And he spake unto the man clothed with linen. This is not typing Jesus Christ because he, the he, is more likely the one that is seen in chapter 1 that's sitting on that throne, which typing Christ. And he spake unto the man clothed in linen. He says, Go between the wheels and under the cherubims and fill thy hand with coal from fire from between the cherubims, and scatter it over the city. Now where is he at? Here's the cherubim. It's not picked up or described in such detail in these vision of Ezekiel. But how many know that God dwells and sits between two cherubims? On that Mercy seat, 
where his presence was in the days of Ezekiel is where the presence of God is. And if you see that altar, the cherubims were facing towards one another, towards the center of it. Its wing was covering over. Now this man is told to go under the wings of the cherubim, not the four cherubims, but under the altar where the wings are at for the coals that's off of that altar, which means it's going to be a message or something God's going to send because he's going to take it here. And he spake unto the man, clothed with linen, go between the wheels and even under the cherub, and fill thy hand with the coals of fire from between the cherubims, and scatter them over the city. And he went in, in my sight, and now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house, and when the man went in, and the clouds filled the inner court. And the glory of the Lord went from above the cherubims and stood over the threshold of the house. Now in the days of Ezekiel, as it's being typed, he takes the coal, they're ready to be delivered. So the Spirit of God is going to lift from the temple and the message of their destruction that's entailed in the different scriptures of Jeremiah and in Ezekiel of the things that was going to transpire is how they were going to go into bondage. There were three events which they were happened for the deportation, the destruction of the temple, and so forth. All this was set down as a judgment on that nation at that hour. Bring it now to Revelation chapter 8, verse 5. Here is an angel. He's finished Time-wise, you're at the end of that seventh seal time factor. The bride's about ready to go up. When he hears that last prayer, the bride's going up in a rapture. But in verse 5, he's told to take the, the burning coals in a censer and throw it towards the earth. And the reason he's throwing it towards the earth, it's going to be sent towards those Jews that's in that week of Daniel. Because those coals of fire are not pleasant things for the nation. Yes, the 144,000 will be saved. Yes, the woman will be saved. But they're going to flee out of there so they don't lose their lives, just like those that believe Jeremiah's message so they wouldn't lose their lives the same way. So both are being typed again. It's a repeat, not the same event, but it's a repeat that's happening over here in that week of Daniel. Yes, as it is to the Jews of the nation, those first three trumpets, that's where that is being projected to. The 104,000, the woman receives a message, and they believe it, and they're going to have their lives saved, not only saved, but they're going to be sealed with the Holy Ghost. But when that's done, when God has brought out the element that he wants saved for that remnant for the nation of Israel... Now the Pope comes in the middle of the week and he kills the two prophets. We have all heard that before, yes. But when he sits in that temple, this is where the coals of fire and the judgment becomes on that nation of Israel. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 25. Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1. Zechariah 13 and 8. That Pope goes against those Orthodox Jews, because they're putting up a fight against him that's sitting in their temple. And it's according to Zechariah, chapter 13, verse 8, two-thirds of them are slain. That's that coal that, that in Revelation 8, verse 5, that's those that's been sent towards that nation. As they are being destroyed, and on top of that, it's even worse because then after they've been slaughtered, then a little later on towards the end of that week comes Armageddon. And after Armageddon comes the day of the Lord. 
But there will be peace in Israel. The temple will not be destroyed. That's true. But that's why I see in Revelation chapter 8, verse 5, those coals that are sent towards the earth are not a message for them. Something that's burning is to destroy and consume something. As it was in the days of Ezekiel or in, with Jeremiah, when that was applied to the nation of Israel, so is it those coals of fire is going to be applied here in that week of Daniel to the same nation again. Well, praise the Lord. So in verse, if we go, we're still in chapter 10 of Ezekiel now. I'll start at verse 5. And the sounds of the cherubim was heard even unto the outer court, as the voice of the Almighty God when he speaks. And it came to pass, when he had commanded, he commanded somebody else, the man clothed in with linen, saying, Take the fire from between the wheels and from between the cherubims. Then he went, see, he went between the cherubims. And went in and stood beside the wheels. And one of the cherubs stretched forth his hand from between the cherubims under the fire that was between the cherubims and took thereof and put it into the hands of the man clothed with linen who took it and went out. In the other description in, in, in that first chapter talks about that it was sent to the city, to the Jews. All right. So as they take this fire to be sent out, and as you would read the chapters in between chapter 1 and chapter 10, you're going to be reading about the destruction or how, how God wants to deal with Israel in that hour. And if he'd done that to the Jew nation at that hour, he's going to do that to this Jew. He's going to bring also judgment on that nation during the week of Daniel. Because otherwise, why would you have this angel here taking the coals from off the altar in heaven and he's cast it to the, well, it's in Revelation chapter 8. Oops. Verse 5, it says here, And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire from the altar and cast it into the earth. Now when he cast it into the earth, here's what the fire is doing. There were voices. Who's the voices? The two prophets. Thunderings, lightning. So that's just to portray in heaven what's going to be projected down towards the earth. And the seven trumpet, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves a sound. And we know what the judgment is, as you can read them in that eighth chapter, because the judgment that's going to be taking place for those coals of fire being sent down is in your eighth chapter of Revelation and then the chapter 11 of the book of Revelation showing what's happening in the week of Daniel here. Well, <clears throat> I think I've about reached my limit what I can speak about this morning. Um, i seen a video. And I would have loved to play it here, but I know it would be flagged. So, so I believe I'll play it Thursday that you can see it. Sometimes we read words and sometimes a picture helps retain. Now, this is as accurate as I can see as someone has placed the picture that you and I can visualize. They just quote the scripture. They're not preaching anything in it. And so, 
in one of the things that, that caught my eye was when it talks about those cherubims touching the wings to one another, they weren't in a straight line. They were around. And when you read in the book of Revelation, it says they were around the throne, not just before the throne. Now those white robes and the, the seer glass, the white robes were before, but not the cherubims. And so, anyway, just a little, little bit more understanding of some of the things that's involved in that eighth chapter of the book of Revelation. Yes, we see, that, oh, yes, we're all enthused about him breaking that seventh seal. And there's a time of half hour and so forth. And then he's offering the prayers of all the saints. That's for us Gentiles. But the latter part of it is pointing to the nation of Israel. Because those seven trumpets are going to sound and those coals of fire are related with those trumpets. And those trumpets are not good news for Israel. How many know that? They're judgment. Fire is meant to burn something. And getting back to when we're looking at this picture here, when Jesus becomes judge and his eyes is like fire, it's to burn something. It's to burn those rewards that are not that not worthy to, to stand. That don't mean we're, if some things that we when we come before him is going to burn, but at least you have some rewards, you will be ruling and reigning with him in the millennium. So those fiery eyes sees in that eighth chapter, that's pertaining to those that are in glory. Because Jesus don't come down. He's up there in glory. But that angel in Revelation chapter 10, that's why he's portrayed with his feet on fire. He didn't come to burn the earth, but he came to burn those things that is not needful of those that comes in that half hour silence in that being judged on their reward. Because remember, he received, that angel received, which he's representing Christ. He received the authority. He has come down. He says he has came down. That's in Luke chapter 19, verse 15. He's come down. And then at that time, not later, not somewhere else, at that time, he brings the servants before him and their judge. Because the seventh seal is already broke, so nobody's going to change position as being bride or not bride. So, I, I'm thankful. So, as we go along, there's sometimes when Satan can't get us with the attacks in our mind, he attacks us in our body. And all. But look at it as the positive side of things. It's to mold you and I. I don't mean to put it. Sometimes he cares too much because he gets <laughs> a lot of things comes your way. But praise the Lord. So as broken as it it is, it less I didn't have all the time that I wanted to because I've had to struggle quite a bit there those first four days this week. So, but the Lord knows all about it. So. Are you happy? You're seeing a little bit more. And so there are types in there. So, And the one of the most mysterious things that's in, uh, that's hard to describe is the details of the vision of Ezekiel. And here's a prophet that's outside the land. He wrote the largest numbers of books in the Old Testament. 48 chapter, more than, than the book of Genesis, more than the book of Exodus and so forth. God showed him from beginning to the end, because as you go into the latter parts of, the, of Ezekiel, he's, Ezekiel's the one that, that seen the war of, of, uh, of 38 and 39, as we, we look at. So, praise the Lord. Yet, he too, his message was not believed much in his day. Because it was prophetic. Prophetic pictures are, are hard to see. They're hard to see for 
carnal mankind. Those who have closed minds will not see it. They don't want it to begin with. But if being true, that picture still holds. Yet he preached that in 500 and between 580 BC till, till the day he died in, in Babylon. He never did get a chance to go home again. But yet God blessed him with marvelous things. The revelation that he received in his day. Praise God. Yet the Jews, uh, Ezekiel, the Torah, not Ezekiel. But to us, it mirrors the love letter of the book of Revelation. And brothers and sisters, we're fastly moving to an hour. One day we'll come in to a period of time, and God's going to change the picture. Because when that miraculous war begins, uh, okay, I better stop. I said I was going to stop because I won't be able to say anything later on at all. Let's just stand. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, this morning. Lord, take the things as broken as they were, Lord. You paint the picture to my brothers and sisters. And Lord, we're ever so thankful for, Lord, lead us on. We thank you, Lord, for the spirit, the comforter that you promised would show us things to come. And Lord, we would just want to praise and thank you this morning. In that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated. Someone still has a need. Uh, while the musicians come. The depth of things that God has in his word. There's always something. But that something has to be in its due course in time. That's the only thing. But for the blood shed on Calvary's tree, but for the blood, there'd be no hope for you and me. For all my righteousness was filthy rags, and that's all I'd ever be. But for the blood. That cleanses and sets me free, but for the blood shed on Calvary's tree, but for the blood there'd be no hope for you and me. For all my righteousness is filthy rags, and that's all. Be but for the blood that cleanses and sets me free, but for the blood shed on Calvary's tree, but for the blood there'd be no hope for you and me. For all my righteousness. Filthy rags, and that's all I'd ever be but for the blood that cleanses and sets me free. But for the blood shed on Calvary's tree, but for the blood, there'd be no hope for you. And that's all I'd ever be But for the blood That cleanses and sets me free
to stand. We'll have a word of prayer and dismiss. Heavenly Father, we're just thankful, Father, for this day, Lord, for your servant. For the words we have heard, Father, I just pray that you would quicken them to our hearts. Give us wisdom and understanding. We pray for each one here this morning and the ones that are listening. Father, and be, be with each one. Bless each one this day. Grant us traveling mercies till we meet again, Father. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and we ask. Amen. Amen. Thank, you. Thank you, Lord.